with how severe the punishment is for breaking the rules, you'd think no one would be dumb enough to break them. Yet there are those who think they're the exemption, the special ones. They think they're smart enough to get around the rules. Rarely does this happen, but when it does, I'm the one they bother, which explains the high-speed pursuit I'm currently having in the Appalachian Mountains. The creature's spindly legs darts desperately above the thick canopies of the woods, a flailing arms breaking every branches with each stride. For a brief moment she glanced back, causing our eyes to meet, which was the only thing I needed. The confusion was evident on the arachne's face as I suddenly disappeared from her view and reappeared behind her, kneeling on her back with a black sword buried between her shoulder blades. Her twelve legs buckled under the pressure and lost its balance, sending her crashing fifty feet down, her ribs shattered, my boots pressed on her neck for extra precaution. I pulled out my tablet and opened a document file. Annabella Contessa. All of her eight eyes shifted to my gaze, but her head can't move due to the weight of my boots, her gasping breath visible in the cold night air. You broke the rules and performed actions outside your designated mode of operation. Sir, please. Her voice straining. I was hungry and... There was a slight crack as I pressed harder on her neck. I twist the sword's handle, slicing upwards in a vertical fashion, splitting her upper body in half. Every single time, they keep using the same old excuses. I look at the next schedule and place a venue in my tablet. I made a mental note of the time. It was 8.47 p.m., and I'm currently standing outside the gates of a large mansion, surrounded by seemingly endless acres of woods. I waited patiently and scanned the area as I passed time. Thirty more minutes had gone by before the one I'm waiting for finally arrived. Gliding in a panic, his foot never touched the ground as he made his way towards me. I'm very sorry for making you wait this long, sir. The wraith-like creature lowers his head apologetically. Humanoid in shape, he was approximately twelve feet high, covered in dark hooded cloak of a long, ripped black cloth that billowed like smoke. Let's keep this night moving, shall we? I ignored his words and began reading a file in my tablet. You have been alive for more than ten decades, which makes you eligible for a senior-level promotion. From the looks of his trembling figure, he was feeling both excited and nervous, since this is a promotional exam, I scroll down on my tab. There will be some added rules that will make things more difficult for you. I trust that you've already been briefed about this at HQ. Yes, sir, he responded quickly. I was informed a month in advance and had already memorized all of the newly added rules. Very well, then. We waited for another hour before we saw a car's headlights approaching the property. They're here, I gestured with my head to the car's direction. Your performance evaluation has officially started. With that as his signal, the wraith dissipates into the air, leaving me alone at the gate's entrance. Car stops just a few feet away from the rusty gate. A guy with messy brown hair steps out from the left rear of the car door. My ass hurts. He complains, massaging his backside. Did we really have to drive five hours all the way here? This story will get us millions of views, Complain later after we're famous. A girl with dirty blonde hair pops the trunk open and starts unloading the camera equipment. Jules helped me with this crate. I'm assuming she was referring to the only other female in the group, the one with cherry blonde hair. Standing barely an arm's length away from where they are. Just like most humans, this group is unable to see me. The gate had not a hinge nor lock. It was open on one side, yet was so wide anything could pass. So despite their tallness and precarious state, it was a simple stroll to the other side. Third, we can start rolling, Jules said with camera on hand. Counting down with his fingers, three, two, one. What is up? The dark-haired guy called Kurt suddenly shouted in an obnoxious manner, followed by a couple of hand signs and arm movement. What the... I look in confusion, not quite sure what I'm seeing. It's me, your boy, Ghost Hunter 69, 
Back again with another video with the squad. The camera pans over to the rest of the group before focusing back to him. This can't be real, I said under my breath, even though it doesn't matter since they can't hear me. Kurt's animated movement and cartoony face abruptly turned somber, as if in mourning. With how quick the change in demeanor was, I knew he was simply putting on an act for the camera. Tonight we're at the place where 24 students met their untimely demise. He took a deep breath, really selling the image that he's sympathizing with the pain the family of the victims are going through. A grisly murder that left everyone shook to their core, with the culprit still remaining at large. This whole case is shrouded with mystery. Kurt took a dramatic first step past the gate, pausing as he looks at the mansion before slowly turning his head back to the camera. But as always, his previous demeanor returned for a brief second. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. He then gestured with his hand for Jules to stop recording. Only then did I put my palm on my face in disbelief after they revealed the purpose of their visit. These people drive all this way to die for likes and views. My thoughts still processing this information. That's it for the intro. Let's call it a day after we set up all the equipment inside. Tomorrow's going to be a full day of filming, Kurt said, helping Cole carry the rest of the gear. I watched as they laid everything down in the living room. They discussed the style and direction of the story's narrative, figuring out how they're going to make the whole thing entertaining. And after having dinner, they decided to sleep in separate rooms. I checked my wristwatch. He should be starting soon. I could sense his presence near the property, but he is not inside the mansion, observing at a respectable distance to not distract or disrupt his performance. He has taken a more physical and tangible form, standing at six feet tall or more. Dark grey ripped jeans paired with combat boots and black tight-fitted long sleeve that displays his athletic lean physique except for the fact that he doesn't have any eyes, mouth, ears, and nose. He looks completely human. Interesting choice. While he does something to the car, I open my tablet and review the new added guidelines, my eyes stopping at the second one. I squinted, making sure I didn't read it wrong. Well, this is quite unreasonable, I thought, as I read the list of rules. Rule 1. You're only allowed to operate in the hours of 8.50 p.m. until 4.30 a.m. Operating outside this time frame will be considered as a direct violation of the rules. Rule 2. Every action must be performed in a tangible form. Killings done in the form of a ghost, specter, wraith, or those that fall under the same category will not be counted in your evaluation points. Violation of this rule will result to imprisonment or further restriction implemented on the offending individual. Now that I start scanning through my own memories, I don't remember that many monsters that's been promoted to senior level. I return my attention back to the examinee. He seems to be taking the car apart, but making sure the outer appearance remains the same. He removed the car's steering wheel and placed it on top of a tree hundred yards away from the mansion. The vehicle's fuel was also siphoned inside a red canister. I followed as he went to the shed and placed the canister on one of the shelves. If his goal was to prevent them from escaping, why do something so elaborate? Why not just stab the tires of the car and be done with it? Just keep things simple. I soon got the answer after I resumed reading. Rule 3. Victims must be given a chance to escape. Obstacles may be placed on their path, but removing any chance of escape is considered bad sportsmanship, which will lead to heavy penalty in the future. You've got to be fucking kidding me, I cursed as I finished reading the last sentence. Do they really expect someone to pass this test? I watched as the examinee ran around all over the place, making preparations, double-checking every contraption he carefully sets up on the property grounds. He's fully aware that the odds are stacked against him, yet he didn't let his determination waver. Time check. 6.47 a.m. Time flew by so quick I almost didn't see the sun rising from the horizon. 
the examinee already finished preparing for everything two hours ago. Now he's mentally preparing himself for the task at hand. On the other hand, Kurt and the rest of his crew began filming. Once again, he starts by obnoxiously introducing himself, followed by forcefully making his voice deeper while narrating the gruesome massacre that took place in this mansion. In the morning, they explored every room, taking their time as each of them shared their own theories on what really happened to the 24 students. In the afternoon, they went deeper into the woods. The group really putting on a performance to convince the viewers that they feel something supernatural is in the area. Kurt then gestured with his hand to stop filming. Okay, so in this scene, Dana will pretend some invisible force grabs her arms. You will then stumble into this soft bushes where Cole will be hiding and drag you away by your feet. All of us will be like, oh my God, what happened? He explained further details before everyone got into position. Jules readies the camera and press record, and the video starts rolling. Rumor has it that there are strong entities roaming in this woods, Kurt started the narration, and we certainly don't want to offend them. So we have to be very respectful of what we... The camera quickly focused to Dana's scream. She acted like something pulled her from behind and fell on the bushes just as planned, but nothing else happened. They waited for five more seconds, but Cole didn't grab Dana's feet. Instead, they heard him scream in pain. Cut, Kurt said, annoyed. Cole, that wasn't on the script. Cole shrieked, his voice echoing in the woods, getting further and further, like he's getting dragged away. Everyone froze, looking at each other. Not sure if this was still part of the video. They remained motionless, still listening to the screams, the voice getting fainter. Everyone drops everything and rushes to the scream's direction. At this point, no one was sure what's going on. Maybe at the back of their mind, they're secretly hoping one of them was pulling a prank on the rest of the group. But after catching up to Cole, those wishful thinking were put to rest. What the fuck? Kurt exclaimed, sharing the same look of shock as everyone else. Cole was hanging upside down on a tree, his nose busted and bleeding, probably from hitting his face on the ground after his leg got caught in the snare trap. The others scrambled around in a panic, trying to find a way to get him down. While standing just a few feet away, the examinee stood perfectly still, hidden among the foliage, his body remain unmoving like the trees around him. Right. I remembered rule number one. He's only allowed to operate starting at 8.50 p.m. The time on my watch says 7.43 Laying this trap in advance gives him at least some form of minor advantage. It didn't take long for them to lower Cole down. He might have sprained his ankle as he was limping and needed assistance to walk. Do you think some hunters might have left that trap? Dana asked. Who cares? Let's go back inside. Cole rubs the side of his chest. Some of the ribs might have been fractured. Another half an hour passed as they take their time carefully walking back the way they came from, making sure not to stray from the path and possibly trigger any more traps. What the hell? Jewel stares at the string under her shoes. Kurt didn't feel the pain at first. Only the sound of something swishing through the air registered in their ears. The group's reaction were delayed, already seeing what happened in front of them, yet their minds still having a hard time processing the information. It started with Dana and Jules, their screams in sync, like an orchestra's symphony. With no longer having Kurt's support, Cole fell to the ground and winced in pain as Rox hits his knees. The bolts of Arrow Lodge on his neck felt cold as the metallic tip touches the back of his throat. Kurt collapsed with a hard thud, his back hitting the ground hard. The blood didn't gush in a constant flow, but matching the rhythm of his beating heart. It came thick and strong, flowing through Dana's trembling fingers that's trying to stop the bleeding in vain. Then it happened. The intimate sound of metal tearing through flesh and crushing bones. Their eyes all fell at the large hook that attached itself inside Cole's left shoulder, the sharp curved end exiting through his collarbone. The screams he let out that day was one of pure fear and desperation. 
pain so mind-numbing he can't choose to faint and barely have the mental strength to stay awake. That same helpless feeling was about to be shared as the metal chain at the end of the hook was slowly getting pulled. Everyone felt ice roll down their spine as they saw the one pulling on the other side of the chain. I checked my watch again. 8.51 p.m. This faceless entity didn't break eye contact with his prey as he pulled Cole closer and closer. Help! Cole's shrill voice lathered in fear. There was no need to think. No votes were made because even if their minds froze, their own body made the choice for them. Like rats, when you turn on the kitchen lights, they all scattered. Only thinking of their own survival, they all ran in different directions. Cole's heart sank as he saw his friends left him to die. In a last-ditch effort, he starts throwing rocks at the killer, even though he felt the flesh in his shoulder starting to separate from his torso as the chains got yanked violently. His words cut short as two hands plunges inside his mouth, clutching tightly on the upper and lower part. It took relatively no effort as the muscles connecting his jaws were ripped apart in opposite directions. His lifeless body discarded to the side without a second glance. Already on the verge of death, the examinee wasn't taking any chances and delivered the killing blow. With his hands wrapped tightly around Kurt's neck, he snaps it in half. I was taken aback when he suddenly left my field of vision. I was about to deduct a point in his evaluation for thinking he broke the second rule, but I stopped, my gaze shifting to the mansion's direction. Oh, I thought, as I realized he didn't shift back into his original form. He teleported. So I followed suit. Upon arriving to their destination, I was greeted by the frantic screams from one of the women as the other scrambles to her feet. Jules, I think her name was. Her leg got caught in the bear trap that was covered with leaves next to the porch. The examinee walks towards her very slowly. Too slow, in fact, it's almost intentional. I didn't get to think too much about it because of what happens next. A roar akin to thunder reverberated in the air as the bullet exit the gun's barrel, sending the examinee staggering to the ground. No blood, but a gaping hole was still present on his chest. What the fuck? Jules exclaimed, watching Dana pry the bear trap open with her bare hands. Adrenaline must be pumping through her veins right now. Why the fuck do you have a gun? I'm American, Dana replied casually. We're in Canada, Jules rebutted. Dana lifted Jules off her feet and runs inside the house. Wow, you work out, Jules asked, as she's being laid down in bed. Hey, where are you going? She grabbed Dana's arm, seeing she was about to leave the room. Don't worry, I'll get us out of here. You'll be safe as long as you don't leave this room. That thing can't enter numbered rooms. What? Jules looks confused, an expression that we currently both share. What did she just say? I watched the examinee walk inside the house and stood motionless outside the door with the number eight sign where the injured woman is hiding, his hand just hovering above the doorknob, unable to touch it. I immediately scrolled down my tablet, scanning through the list of rules, and there it was. Rule 17. You cannot enter numbered rooms. Newly attached numbers to the door does not count and can be entered. The number must have already been present in less than a year the building was established. How does she know this? I stared blankly into my tablet. Just trust me, Dana yelled, quickly climbing down the window. Jules takes a deep breath before slapping herself hard on both cheeks. Okay, fine, she yelled. But you know I'm haunting you first if I turn into a ghost, right? Clearly she was trying to hide her fear with humor. Dana chuckled. Yeah. She tied her hair into a bun. I got this shit. This time my attention was solely on this woman. Clearly there was something strange going on here. What was it? Which part? She was mumbling to herself while dashing through the woods. I got it, she exclaimed, as if remembering something. Rule number 24. What? No. She can't possibly... I look at the rules, but there's no Rule 24. The list ends at Rule 19. So what Rule 24 is she referring to?
She makes an abrupt stop and starts climbing a tree, the same tree where the steering wheel was hidden. What is happening right now? I ask no one in particular. Taking a quick detour, she returned to the scene where the first kill happened. She kneels next to the body and grabs something before putting it in her pocket. Wasting no time, she rushes back, this time mumbling more words to herself. Instead of going straight for the car, she runs toward the shed located on the right side of the mansion, only taking a few seconds to come out with the red canister filled with the fuel that was taken from their car. Dana, behind you, Jules yells from the window. But there was no trace of fear or any concern in Dana's face, only confidence. She didn't stop pouring the fuel in the car until the canister was completely empty. Run, he's getting closer. Jules screamed, this time even more desperate. Don't worry, she smiled, attaching the steering wheel, the last piece they needed. He's not allowed to run. With those words, my eyes ran through the list again. Rule 12. During an active pursuit, you must maintain a steady pace of a normal walk. Running, sprinting, or anything of the same nature will be grounds for punishment. My grip on my tablet tightens, nearly threatening to crush it as my glare aims at Dana like a sniper rifle. She gives some kind of hand signal to her friend before luring the examinee to the back of the mansion. I observe as their teamwork functions like a well-oiled machine. While Dana leers the threat away, Jules, despite having an injured leg, will still have time to limp her way to the car. And it didn't take no time at all. Dana! Jules yelled, already turning the car around. The engine roaring, ready to leave any second. Tearing through the corner of the mansion as if on cue, Dana appeared with blood dripping down her shoulder, a knife buried on top of the wound. She was running at full speed, but stopped shortly a few feet away from the car. Let's go! Jules screams, her sweaty palm gripping the steering wheel. What are you waiting for? The examinee was almost an arm reach away from her. But before he could take another step, she grabs something from her pocket and tosses it on the ground. I look at the dark substance she scattered at the examinee's feet. Soil, I surmised. Probably that thing she took earlier and put in her pocket. But why? Got you now, bitch. Dana's fist connected to the examinee's jaw. It didn't knock him out, he simply remained in place. In fact, he didn't move at all. At this distance, he should be able to grab her so easily, so why is he just standing there? Dana pressed her face even closer, her nose only a few inches away from the faceless killer. She spreads her arm wide in a taunting position, challenging him to do something, but he remained unmoving like a statue. Yeah, what? Dana taunted even more, thrusting her hips and pelvis in the air. Yeah, that's right, she shouted triumphantly, landing another punch to his face. Rule 27, bitch. In her final act, she spit on his face before finally jumping in the car. And just like that, only the smoke left from the tires served as proof that they were actually here. I just stood there for a moment, looking for the words to say. What happened? I revealed my presence to the examinee. How did she know that? The examinee asks in a dejected tone. Even I forgot about that one, until today. What exactly did she do? I'm still trying to make sense of all this. One of the ways to temporarily stop my kind, he spoke as if he had just been violated, soil drenched from the blood of our first kill of the day. This has gotten quite complicated, but we must continue. Sadly, I must inform you that you have failed the exam. He slowly morphs back to his original form. The wraith-like figure floats steadily in front of me, his head lowered and eyes facing the ground. I see. In sorrow, but his tone was in full acceptance of the result. I understand. His skeleton hands emanating dark smoke clasps together. Clearly he was disappointed in the results, but more likely he was disappointed in himself. However, I cleared my throat... There are some irregularities in this situation, which may have caused the negative results in your test. 
which is why I'm sending a request to allow you to retake the promotional exam. He couldn't hide his excitement as dark flames billows from his cloak. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. His gaze still on the ground, afraid to make eye contact. Someone from the company will contact you if the request gets approved by the board. I took a quick glance at my watch. Until then, continue on with your daily life. Kill people with the rules and parameters you've been assigned with. Saying what I needed to say, I teleported back to the main headquarters. Damon, a woman wearing a secretary uniform with long dark hair and pitch black eyes, scans me from head to toe with her eldritch gaze. You're not one for casual talks. What brings you to my office? Mariposa, we have a problem. Define problem. She smirks, returning her focus back to the paper she's reading. With Azathoth's offspring threatening to breach our dimension every week and the unchecked backrooms manifesting in every corner of the globe, you're going to have to be more specific. Someone is leaking the rules to the public. All of her eight pitch black eyes shot open. Her playful demeanor now gone. Black tentacles with green bioluminescent suction cups appeared seemingly out of nowhere filling half of the room. Abyssal cracks appeared on the walls with eldritch eyes peering from the other side. The corners of the wall transforming into a fleshy, cavernous moor as rows of sharp teeth emerges from the ceiling. What? Her voice calm and controlled, but behind it, I could feel a tempest growing. 